Well, it's Easter Sunday, which means he is risen. Come on, somebody. He's risen. We were here gathered together on Friday to remember what Jesus did on the cross. See, Friday, we reflect to him dying, but on Sunday, we remember him rising. And only, man, the reason Good Friday is good is because Sunday is here. If Jesus stayed in that grave, it's not a good story, but I'm here to tell you it's a good story, and that story is still alive, and that story is still changing lives. Come on, somebody. He's real. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship here with us today to celebrate our risen Savior. Hey, I just want to say at the top, thanks for being here. My name is Dylan Robinson. I'm the campus pastor at the Well Marshfield. Uh, man, if you don't have a church home, we pray that this will become your church home. We, we just want to welcome you here today. Um, I want to give a disclaimer. At the very end of my sermon, we're going to be watching a video, a very powerful video um, of a family's testimony in our church. And it's a graphic video, not that the things in the video are graphic, like, but the things that they are talking about are graphic. And so before we play the video at the end, I will uh, let you know we're about to play it. And so if there are some young ones in here that you don't um, feel like they should be able to hear that, I mean, you can take them out and come back in at the end of the video. But super excited for you to hear that. But we've been in this little mini series from Good Friday to now, uh, talking about Easter and going from death to life. Say that with me, please. From death to life. And we know that Jesus' death and resurrection I mean, not only applies to him, but it applies to us. Because you got to realize that our sin separated us. I mean, the cross connected us with Jesus, but check this out, the resurrection freed us. See, the same spirit that was in Jesus is the same spirit that's here today. And what's amazing is Jesus died on our cross. He died on the cross for us, but he rose again also for us so that way man, we can live again. Man, I'm telling you today, whether you don't know him as your savior or you do, he is really good and he is looking to take somebody from death to life in this place. But the reality of it is, some of you are like, what are you talking about death to life? And we believe that sin separates us and that we are truly dead spiritually if we do not have the Holy Spirit within us. And so it's our prayer that you'll leave here today in a relationship with Jesus. So I want to preach a message this morning on Easter morning called Raised to Life. See, not only historically can we prove that Jesus rose from the dead. I've preached on that in years past of how we can prove it, not just because of the Gospels, not just because of the Word, but there are secular writings that attest to this as well. But not only is, can this be proved historically, it can be proved personally. Think about it. How many of you came today? Because, man, some of you, you haven't been in church in a long time, but your grandma or your mom told you, you better go to church on Easter, so you came. And we're glad that you came today. But how many of you, for the others, you know you came here today, man, to attest to the resurrection power that Jesus changed you. You once were lost, but now you're found. You once were dead, but now you're alive. And so you came here today to say, listen, I'm not just worshiping a historical event 2,000 years ago. I'm here to testify today. The same God then is the same God now, and he's still changing my life. He's still changing my family's life because that's what it's about. He raised us from death spiritually. But the good news is, even if we die physically, the only reason we wouldn't is if Jesus comes to resurrect his church. And I just wonder if there's anybody who still believes the word of God and believes that Jesus will come again and take his church up. I believe that. But see, the old is gone and the new is here. And regardless of your background, regardless of what you believe, maybe you're a skeptic today and say, man, I'm just here to check the box and get out of here and get some lunch. Hey, that's all right. But it is my prayer that you leave here knowing that there's a God who's madly in love with you. It's not a question if God loves us. The question is, do we love him? See, our, our world paints God to be this dictator, this, some deity up in the sky who doesn't care about us. Can I tell you, God loves you more than you could ever imagine. But we got to begin to have faith to believe that his word is true. I want to read Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. It'll be up on the screen. Talks about the resurrection. It says this. It says, but very early on Sunday morning, 
The women went to the tomb, taking the spices they prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. And as they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, but that he would raise again on the third day. Would you pray with me one more time? Father, thank you for sending your Son to die for us. But God, thank you for raising your Son to live for us. God, I I pray that the enemy has no hold in this place. And regardless where people are on the faith spectrum, I pray that your spirit would just move in a powerful way here today. Jesus, we love you, and we pray this in your name. And everybody said a big amen. So amen. You know the spirit's coming today. So like I said, man, we're not here just historically celebrating an event. We're here personally. And I'm just curious. You don't have to raise your hand, but... Man, if you can testify honestly here, I'm not just looking for you to raise your hand. If you can testify that Jesus not only changed your life a long time ago, but he's still changing your life, can you just lift a hand to testify? And so if you're a skeptic, I want you to look around and say, man, these people are the ones who you think are crazy. Welcome. You drank the Kool-Aid, man. We're praying that you drink the Kool-Aid later. We have this many people, not just in this place, but all around the world, not just the nation, but the world, celebrating Someone who is dead, but now alive. Listen, even if you think you are more intellectual than anyone else, and you think that Christians are crazy, and we are all a little bit crazy, can I just ask, can I propose the question, isn't it fascinating that thousands upon thousands upon millions upon millions of people are here today celebrating the resurrecting king of Jesus? And so if that's the case, we got to ask the question, maybe, just maybe, there's something to this whole Jesus thing. Because it's either he is dead, and he was a crazy person, or he's alive, and he is God. There's no in between. Well, I'm agnostic. No, you're either a believer, or you're not. But see, for me, and many of you know my story, I'm not going to get into that, but I do want to recite the night that Jesus radically transformed my life. And just for those that are here and say, preacher, what do, you, what do you know about this good news? Well, I grew up in a very, very broken home. I grew up doing drugs at a pretty early age. I watched abuse unlike you could imagine. I've seen these different things. That was my life. I was a drug addict by the time I was 16. I'm getting drunk and and getting high every day of my life. I'm about to drop out of high school. I got an assault charge. My life is going nowhere. But in one moment, this thing happened, and this thing is actually a person. His name's Jesus, and he transformed me from the inside out. And so before you ride me off, just listen. Because I I wasn't a, a PK, a pastor kid. I mean, I wasn't raised in Sunday school. I don't know any of the old songs. All the really holy people start singing all these hymns and all these child songs, and I just open my mouth acting like I know the words, and I don't know them. Because I didn't grow up in church singing that. I was a skeptic. I was mad at the world. I hated the people around me. But on February 21st of 2010, Jesus radically transformed my life. I got saved and baptized at midnight because there's no party like a Holy Ghost party. I'm telling you now. But here's the crazy thing is, even though that's incredible and that's obviously the foundation of of what changed my life, what's even crazier is 13 years later, man, God has changed me and he's changing my family. There was zero people in my family going to church who were believing in Jesus so that I knew. And now God is raising up Christians left and right in my family. You say, well, Dylan, I mean, just maybe, just maybe, you can say what you want, but I'm here to tell you, I'm not celebrating a dead God today. I'm celebrating a risen God because it, the evidence is all around. And, and, and that's the greatest testament that our God is still alive is because he's changing people's lives. There's people in this room who you know, man, they used to be like that. I, I preached at our Good Friday service on Friday. And there's a person I hadn't seen in a long time, and we used to roll around together in Springfield a long time ago. And he was here. I was like, what's up, man? He gets done with the service. We get done with the service. He comes up to me. He goes, bro, you're a preacher? I said, yeah. He goes, wow. 
Yeah, man, God's good. You know, man, I'm just here to tell you today, you don't know that your own life is a testament to those around you. See, somebody might not like you, but they can't ignore you. They might not like your faith. You keep on, man, you're annoying because all you do is share stuff on social media about Jesus. But they got to realize, man, that person used to be like that. Or if they had a pretty normal life for a long time, maybe it's not what God delivered them from, but it's what he prevented them from. So what I want to look at here this morning as we focus in on some things is this. Jesus' resurrection brings us from death to life in our past, in our present, and in our future. Look up at me. There are some things, whether you are a believer or not, who you would admit there are some dead areas in your life right now. And you are just believing or asking, if you're not a believer, God, if you're real, would you bring this area of my life from death to life? See, going back to what we read, Luke 24, it said, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee. For 30 years, Jesus was just being normal. While he was fully God, he was fully man. But man, at the age of 30, he began his ministry. And for three years, he began to heal people. He began to, to then do miracle after miracle. But the greatest miracle, the greatest mission, should I say, was him to go on the cross. Then came the greatest miracle for him to raise again. And he was telling his disciples, man, this is what's going to happen. And, and he was telling the Pharisees, that, man, listen, I'm the son of man. And they would not believe it. But when it happened, because it did happen, the angel said, why are you looking for someone who's a de who is dead when he is alive? He told you this all along. And some of you, you've heard this life-giving message of Jesus for a long time. Some of you, you know how it's impacted you. Others, you do not know the power of how it's impacted you. And I'm telling you, when you begin to come to this place where you say, God, I'm dead on the inside. That was me for years of my life. I walked around with a fake smile on my face. I was alive physically, but dead spiritually. And when the life-giving power of Jesus came in within me, then I began to realize all that I heard about God was not some facade, but it's real. And some of you, I'm believing that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day where, as Jesus told his disciples, because I live, you live, and I'm praying that you live here today alive unlike you ever have lived before. And I'm not telling you it's an easy life. It's the hardest life you've ever dreamed of. You're like, boy, that's exciting. <laughs> but it's the most fulfilling life you could ever imagine. Amen. So let's look at the past. I want to read Ephesians for our scripture today. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. It says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander and powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Listen, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. This idea of once, this past tense, you used to live that way. Now, we all got a different story. All of our sin looks a little bit different. Some is more public than others, but I'm here to tell you today, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. And for some of you, that's offensive. But the word tells us that our best deed, our most righteous deed, is like a, wash, a dirty washcloth compared to God's righteousness, which means there's no such thing as good people and bad people. Listen, there's this misconception that the gospel is about making bad people good. That is not what it's about. The gospel is about bringing dead people to life. But see, to me, it was freeing. When I realized that I was... A sinner just like everyone else. I looked at the people who I thought were good, and I was like, we're on the same playing ground, brother. I got a track record that looks longer than yours, let me tell you. But we're on the same playing ground. Some of you, you've tried to earn your way into a relationship with God. You're trying to do more good than bad, and, and you're trying to achieve God's goodness. And I'm here to tell you, when Jesus said it is finished on the cross, that meant it is finished. You don't got to work your way into heaven. You just got to believe your way into heaven. But based on God's word, not your word. See, we all have a past. I told you my past and my wife Maddie, we have two different pasts. 
two different paths, but we were both sinners and we needed Jesus to change us. And that's what happened. But what we need to realize, and, and here's the, the battle that the enemy is really just, or, or the weapon that the enemy is using, we begin to dismiss the enemy. We say, well, he's just, he's just that one guy over here who tries to just make me be bad. That's not what the word says. It says that you obeyed the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. I'm not trying to condemn you here today, but I'm just trying to be a faithful messenger. There's no such thing as just, oh, I'm kind of bad. It's, man, we're either for God or against God, no in between. And some of you, the greatest attack the enemy has is, is getting you to believe that the enemy is not real and that God is not real. And you think that you're smarter than everyone else, but what you don't realize is you have a veil over your eyes. Others of you, you know the word, but you just don't believe the word and you surely don't live it out. And rather than making you feel less than and making you feel like, man, that that is just all that there is. Listen, that's the bad good. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus paid our sin on the cross. So if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved, which means we got a white canvas. All the things that Dylan used to do and has done since is forgiven and loved because I have an empty grave that says, that's why I came for him and for you and for everyone else. What are you ashamed of? Like, what is the thing? Maybe you walked in this room here today, and we live in a small town, right? And so if something happened publicly, maybe you walked in, and someone goes, oh, that's, or man, ah, I should have been coming to church for, you know, for a while now, but it's been a whole year, and we begin to feel shame. Can I tell you, that is of the enemy, and he's accusing you. But Jesus paid the price on the cross because he forgives you. And so when the, when the enemy begins to accuse, Jesus says, yeah, but I got his tab. I got her tab. I paid that price, so we're in good standing now. He covered, he took away your past. See, John 10, 10 says, the thief's purpose is to steal, is to kill, and to destroy. But my purpose, who is Jesus' purpose, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. The enemy tries to steal your life, but Jesus gives you life. Do not walk out of here today being spiritually dead, but rather be alive knowing that Jesus loves you, he died for you, and he wants to take away your past. But the second thing is, and here's the good news too, is he gives us a great present. And I'm not just talking about a gift. I'm talking about he changes our environment around us. It goes on to say in Ephesians 2, it says, but God is so rich in mercy that he loved us so much that even though we were dead, not physically dead, he's talking spiritually. Physical dead is when your body is removed from your soul. Spiritually dead is where your soul is removed from God, so we're separated. It says, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. If you are a new believer, everybody say new. If you are a new believer, check this out. Your identity is not in what you used to do. It's in what Jesus did for you. And that, that's multifaceted. It has a double meaning there. Some of you, the enemy's greatest attack on you is your past. You're this and this and this. Here's what I believe for all the years of my life until I got saved. I'm a Robinson. I'm from the wrong side of the tracks. Man, I'm this, I'm this and this. And I remember teachers saying, oh, you're just like your daddy. Oh, I know who your parents are. I got that all through my life. And what's so awesome is I got a heavenly daddy now who says that's my son who I love and care for. And so what he used to do is no longer who he is now because I've given him hope in a future. And he's got a present future right now. And I'm here to tell somebody today, your past is your past. And God has a new present if you will let him in your heart. But what's the second part of it? We're at the master's golf clap right there, right? But here's the other side, man. So Dylan, yeah, man, that's your story, bro, but I grew up in a good home. I've always had a pretty good reputation. I've been smart. I've gotten good grades. That's not really for me. But what, don't, what you don't realize, just like we talked about, how the enemy will use that as, a, as an attack on you to prevent God's goodness, is your present identity and your present circumstances, is, stay with me, 
based on your intellect. It's based on your job. It's based on the money in your bank account. And can I tell you, that is miserable. Your identity is based on what you look like. And I'm here to tell you, gravity's gonna win. If you don't know what that means, get to me in a few years. Be 30 this June, and I know I'm young, but the other day, and I told our church this a few weeks ago, Maddie goes, is that a white hair? I'm like, behind me, Satan, no. She left, I'm like, it is. See, one day, we're gonna look a little bit different. We won't be as strong, we won't be as smart. And what's so freeing about that is, it's not all on us, it's all on God. It's all I got to do is what he asked me to do. It's not my own strength. It's his strength. It's not my own ability to lead. This is his church. This is his mission. And I'm telling you, God wants to begin to bring life in you and your family. He wants to begin to bring the God at the center of your family where you don't just pray for your food, but may you pray for your kids before they go to bed. And when you go out and you see people hurting and broken, you're going to help them generously because you know that Jesus was generous with his life. So we're going to be generous with our lives. It's saying, God, I want my life to be about your life. And when you begin to do that, it changes you. But here's what you need to know. We are so good in the American church about the gospel where God sent Jesus to die for us. But check this out. Jesus not only died, he rose again, and he gave us his Holy Spirit on Pentecost Sunday, which means the Holy Spirit changes us from the inside out. So not only does he just forgive us of our sins, and, 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 and we just begin to think, well, now that he saved me, then that's great. But, man, I've got to operate my own strength now, and I'm going to always have this temper. I'm going to always have, have this mouth. I'm going to always have this addiction. But praise God that Jesus died for me. Can I tell you, praise God that Jesus died for you, but praise God that, that that he raised Jesus from the dead and gave us the Holy Spirit so that way he transforms us from the inside out and begins to make us more like him rather than like me. Right. I don't have time for it, but I'm gonna read one verse. Man, it tells us in Colossians 3.10, put on your new nature. Everybody say new. new. When you break that down, in it's original language. It really means new. You don't get that. I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> to be renewed. Some of you, you've been saved, you've been forgiven, but you're still living like you're the old person. I got news for you. It's time to be the new person who Jesus created you to be. Come on, somebody. The third and final point is future. Aren't you thankful that Jesus gives us a future? See, it tells us in verse 7, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. As shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Listen, if you haven't listened to anything, would you just humor me? Future is something that is so unknown. And I'm not just trying to be a hellfire and brimstone preacher. That's not me. But I want you to know tomorrow is not promised. I've done a lot of funerals in my life. Some people that are older... Some who were younger and died way too soon. And I don't know about you, but what a tragedy it would be. What a tragedy it would be if you spent all of eternity separated from God, knowing you could have been with him forever. But praise God, that doesn't have to be your future. Because God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal, which means forever, life. God has eternal life for you if you're in Christ Jesus. But here's what you need to know. God wants to use you and your story for the future generations. Here's what I mean by that. If you notice, it says, so God can point to us in all future ages. I told you that when I got saved, man, that was a new thing for my family. I'm not saying that there weren't Christians in my family, but I sure didn't see it talk, lived out. I didn't hear it talked about. And when God changed me, he really used my little brother to get a hold of my heart. My little brother was in social services in DFS. I saw him once a week for 30 minutes, and God used him just to begin to think about his future. But the reality of it was, man, I knew that I couldn't give him the example that he needed. But when God changed me, I began to, to just live out this new life that God had. And people were saying, Dylan, are you still doing this Jesus thing? Dylan, do you want to come and party? I said, no. 
I know, that, I know where that life's taken me. I know I'm going to end up in the pen. I know I'm going to be another statistic. But I believe that God has a life and life to the fullest for me. And I was fighting it. And there was temptation. That's why I mean it's a hard life. There were temptations. And my mom in and out of prison. Still to this day, in and out of my life. But man, I knew I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. I'm believing that God's going to restore my family. I'm going to believe that God's going to do it. And can I tell you today, 13 years later, the wife of my dreams, two amazing children, where we get to raise them in a home where all they know is mom and dad love them and provide for them and that God saved their daddy. And so that way, a few generations later, a few generations later, when they hear some stories about, yeah, here's where your family came from, they say, I don't even know. Because all I know is, my future's bright because my God changed our destiny. I want you to watch this video. So he, I woke up with Brandon standing at like an, standing with a knife in my doorway. The kids had went to their mothers. Um, it was New Year's Eve, so it was supposed to be a time that was you know wonderful and great and a celebration. Um, but uh, we get a phone call and it said, uh, "Have you seen?" You know, she's screaming, "Have you seen the news?" And says that uh, my daughter and my son have been attacked. And so, at first, you don't want to believe something like that, you know. Um, the night before, like, I guess everything happened, um, Brandon was sitting on the bed and he told me he loved me. And I, I, I saw myself loving him. At one point, he was the only kind of stepdad that my mom, like, ever dated that I was like, okay, maybe I could love him one day, but I've only known him for a couple of months, so I didn't want to say it back at that point. So on that morning, they called my son in the back room and he um, attacked him with a knife. He had stabbed him over and over again. Uh, my son was stabbed 87 times. And the only reason why I know that number is because it was the number that they gave me at the, at the uh, funeral home. Uh, after, after attacking Dylan, he went into the living room. And then, uh, no, I, he actually went into Lisa's room and uh, started attacking Lisa. All I remember like, he, is him running after me with a knife. And I'm like thinking in my head, like, is this a dream? What is happening? Like, I'm so confused. And then he started like cutting me and um, I remember squirming and like trying to get him away from me. And um, he started cutting really, really fast. And so I laid there like in the floor and acted like I wasn't like alive. You know, I stopped breathing and um, he went out the doors. And so I ran out the um, that door to try and like leave. And he slammed me against my grandma's bed that was sitting in the living room and stabbed, stabbed me really hard in my side. And um, my mom ran after him and told him to stop hurting her baby. And I remember her standing there like yelling, babe, stop, babe, stop. And I ran out the um, back door and I was kind of surprised that I could get out the back door because you can never get out that door without um, like some kind of like tool to like, you know, twist it and open it. And um, I opened it like bleeding out. And that was kind of the first sign that God wanted me to stay alive, you know, that he had a plan for me. Um, and I ran to the neighbor's house and was pounding on the door and I really just wanted someone to answer. And no one would answer the door. And right as I sat down and thought like my life was over, um, some people showed up and they came um, and one of, and the girl held my neck so I wasn't gonna bleed out. I had already heard that my son was probably dead and so at this point I just asked where my kids were. I wanted to know where my kids were. Um, they finally told me where Elisa was and she was at the hospital. I prayed and prayed and prayed because I, I you know, I'd already come to the realization that Dylan was gone. Um, my son was gone because I'd heard that in the news and nobody would tell me where he was. And I remember just 
begging God, like, listen, like, I don't know why you had to take Dylan, but please, God, don't take her too. She eventually got her tube out, and I remember that being probably the most heartbreaking moment was, uh, you know, having to sit and tell Lisa, listen, your mom and Dylan didn't make it. And I didn't want to believe it. I was like, no, they didn't. Like, you guys told me they were fine. Like, they're fine. Because while we loved God, we literally had no idea what to tell somebody at yeah. this. Like, how do you tell somebody that just went through that why your family didn't make it? Well, and she kept saying during it, too, that I think I saved them. I think I saved them. Like I said, I wasn't really close to my mom. So, like, I obviously missed her. But um, my brother, on the other hand, like, he was truly probably my best friend. Um, I remember just crying and bawling because I didn't want my little brother to be gone. And um, I remember um, thinking it was my fault because I could have saved him. I could have saved my mom. Um, and I didn't, like, I'm the reason they're gone. And uh, I remember blaming God for it and I didn't want anything to do with God. I didn't want anything to do with being a Christian. Like, there was nothing. I remember laying in bed and thinking about it's just the horrible things that uh, that I wanted to do, that I wanted to do. The man that took my son and hurt my daughter. It gets to the point where I'm yelling at my kids, yelling at the wife, yelling at everybody because I'm mad. I'm angry at what happened, and and it's never the person that causes the damage that gets to feel that. It's always the people around you that feels it. So, you know, I was I was an addict my whole life, and here I am. I've turned my life over to God. And I've, I've tried to do better, and I've started, and I, I am, I'm doing a whole lot better. Um, and then something like this happens. And so naturally, you go back to being an addict. I mean, that's what the world tells us, is naturally we go back to being an addict, and we go back to doing the things that we know because, um, because that's what we're good at. It's what's easy. Meanwhile, sitting there saying, God, why did you let this happen? And I also remember you know, him saying, listen, don't touch alcohol, don't touch pills, because you're so hurt right now that if you, if you were to possibly start any of that, it'll never end. And so I remember God, and I know it was God. I remember, only God could you know, be able to reason with me in that time. Eventually, I prayed about it enough that God's like, listen, you gotta let this go, and so I did. And I laid in my bed one night, and I prayed for Brandon. I prayed that he would find salvation and that I would be able to find forgiveness for Brandon, and God gave it to me. He's, it, it, was, it was a process, and it took time, but God definitely gave it to me. We'd stopped altogether going to church, and I remember just we could feel it, like yeah. things that were changing, and we were like mo separating, moving away, and we were like, we've got to find where our church home is now. Like, we've got to get back in church, and well, here's the deal. We're just going to pour ourselves into it, into God so much that the enemy will be afraid to attack us right, again. Right, or absolutely. if he does, that there's no yeah. way that he'll break us next time, ever. And so we had some friends of ours reach out and... We started going to the well. Um, I remember the first time I went to the well, we were absolutely against it. <laughs> so we walked in there and like automatically, I could feel like all the warmth of the people and like how much the people actually cared about you and how much they didn't judge you. I like remember it like automatically changing my life and like him saving me completely and uh, like God being there for me. And that's when I truly realized that God was the reason like I stayed alive. And like for me, whenever people say like God saved me, like I say that like he saved me not only like mentally, but he physically saved me because he is the reason I am still standing. You know, God just started blessing us. He blessed us with a, you know, peace, peaceful heart, peaceful mind. And even though all this hurt and, and all this tragedies happen, um, there's so much that good that God has used it for. You know, I feel like the devil wanted to tear our family apart. Uh, and that's what he does. He kills, steals, and destroys. And he wanted to destroy us. Um, and so he attacked us, but God, has taken that and he has, it's not just our family going to church on Sunday anymore, it's its our surrounding family as well, meaning, you and know. And just people that we are just people able that to we're reach, able out, to reach to. out to. Yeah, so, uh, he didn't get his way. <laughs> he's not gonna win, so. Uh, like, he's, he's the only reason I'm like, 
sleeping today. The only reason, like, I'm not having, like, suicidal thoughts like I used to, like, I'm not against him and I want to be for him and I want, like, I want to be there. While we still have trauma from what happened to our son and some, some emotions, um, I don't think those ever go away. But through Dylan's actual death, we have been able to come to life as a family. I think that uh, I think that life has a new definition now. So Dylan's death has definitely brought a lot of life into our house, into our home, and to the people around us. I know, I know that he's up in heaven, and I know that he's having a wonderful time, better than anything we could possibly have here. And I know that uh, I know that I hurt, but he doesn't. And one day I'm going to get to reunite with him. So. Can we give it up for him? Come on now. Pretty powerful, amen? I want you to stay standing. There's no words. But man, I just think at the very end what they said, that through Dylan's death, their son, it brought life to the family. And sometimes, man, while the enemy will use tragedy to destroy us, the word tells us in Romans 8, 28, that God will use all things, even the tragic, for good. We know that the enemy is real. There's no denying it when you hear stories like that. But I just want you to know here today, regardless of your story, regardless of how radical or normal you think you are, your story is, I want you to know that God can bring you from death to life, spiritually, and one day, physically. As Jason shared, Their boy's in heaven. He had a relationship with Jesus. However, on this side of heaven, it hurt. But they'll be the first to tell you that the strength they have is the resurrection power of Jesus. And their story is powerful no matter what. You take God out of the story, it's still powerful. But wait, what makes the story more powerful, where it gets its power from, is that Satan had his grip on them for so long. And he thought he won. He thought that through the death of their son that that would be the final thing for them to curse God and die. But instead, they stand here today on Easter Sunday to give God the glory of his resurrection power. And that same power can be yours here today. Would you give it up for him one more time? You can stay standing. I'm not gonna just let anybody come up here and share this story, I promise you that. I've walked it out with them for a while and I've just played a small part. So many people, the Rose family especially, and so many others come alongside them. But it was the epitome of the church being the church. And what's sad is some of you can hear that story today, and you're so blinded spiritually. Look up at me. You're so blinded spiritually. You say, well, yeah, I'll never be in that situation that you don't realize the enemy has you right where he wants you. Do not let it take a tragedy to let Jesus bring you spiritually alive today. While you're standing, if you would, just close your eyes. If you're here in this place, and through the preaching of the word and through the worship and the testimony. 
the word says that we'll be saved by the blood of our, the lamb and the words of our testimony. And there's some people here today, there's something inside of you, which is the Holy Spirit, who is connecting the dots in your life. And you're just saying, man, the things that these guys are talking about is what I've wondered for so long. And I, listen, sometimes the church will get it wrong. So, sometimes we mess it up. Sometimes we can not treat people the kindest. And sometimes in our humanity, we'll get in the way of God. But I'm just here to tell you, don't let Christians, don't let the church be an excuse for you not to fall in love with your heavenly father. So if you're here today, eyes closed. This isn't for your, your neighbor. This is for you. Listen, tomorrow is not promised, church. Well, when I get this job, when I settle down, when my friends get older and I quit hanging out with them, no, 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 no. Today, you decide. Because you're either for God or against him and no in between. If you're here and you say, Dylan, I want Jesus Christ into my heart. I need to go from death to life spiritual. I want you to raise a hand wherever you're at. Lift them up boldly in this place. Lift them up. Father, I lift those hands up. Father, I pray that it's not just a hand raised and it's not just lip service, but God, I pray, God, that they truly accept you in their heart. Believing as we call upon the Lord, we will be saved. Jesus, heal them. Father, thank you for those. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put your hands down. We're going to open up the altars. If you're not familiar with that, it's just a, it's a place of surrender. I know God's been in this place. They're down here on both sides. You can make up here an altar, but we're just going to invite you to come down and pray. And so at this time, if you feel the Lord just calling you out, man, we're going to invite you to come and take a, a step of faith. And it might be scary for you. You don't have to come down, but I just want you to know, don't miss your opportunity. God's in this place. He's moving. Worship team's going to play. Let's respond to what the Lord's doing.